Now on to the pulmonary circulation. So the oxygen and carbon dioxide content of blood each have different effects on the pulmonary and systemic circulation. This is an important concept to understand as it will help you reason through situations where you may not have an immediate answer. First, let's look at oxygen. Systemically, a decrease in alveolar PO2 shunts blood away from less ventilated regions of the lung. This can lead to pulmonary hypertension, which we'll discuss in a bit. Another important concept to understand is when and how gas exchange is limited by either diffusion or perfusion. In healthy individuals, gas exchange is limited by perfusion. So what does perfusion limited mean? As you can see here, gas equilibrates early along the length of the capillary, and you can only get more oxygen into the blood by increasing blood flow. Normally, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide are perfusion limited. And you can see this also here in the figure on the right where you can see that the pressure of a given gas in the blood and in the alveolar air reaches an equilibrium quickly and no further gas exchange occurs while the same blood is in the pulmonary capillary. Then you can contrast this to the figure in the middle where gas exchange is limited by diffusion. So when can you see this? Well you can see this with carbon monoxide and with oxygen in pathologic states in which the gas either has to diffuse across a further distance such as with pulmonary fibrosis here and here or it has a smaller surface area to diffuse across as an emphysema. As you can see, blood is not in the pulmonary capillaries long enough to reach equilibrium with the alveolar air. So increased blood flow here to the lungs wouldn't really be helpful. All right now finally, what happens in exercise? You can see the equilibration occurs here late along the length of the pulmonary capillary. What's going on here? Well, this is because the blood velocity is increased through the capillary bed, so there is less time for the oxygen to equilibrate. All right, so let's talk about pulmonary hypertension. This is a super high yield topic, so you're going to want to start now for later review. Now, pulmonary hypertension is currently classified into five groups, but for our purposes, it's still useful to think of pulmonary hypertension as primary and secondary. So what is primary hypertension? Primary mostly corresponds to idiopathic or hereditable pulmonary arterial hypertension. One major cause, although not the only cause of primary pulmonary hypertension, is an inactivation mutation in the bone morphogenic protein receptor type 2, or the BMPR, or the BMPR-2 gene. This is a member of the TGF beta signaling family whose normal function is to inhibit vascular smooth muscle proliferation. Now, when you talk about secondary pulmonary hypertension, you can think about it as being caused by everything else. So, what are those conditions? Well, they include COPD, mitral stenosis, CHF, which we don't have on the list here, recurrent thromboemboli, anything that causes a light left to right shunt. Other things include sleep apnea, living at a high altitude, and certain drugs such as the fen, -fen combination for weight loss, which is no longer available. So think for a moment about the underlying disease mechanisms and how each might contribute to the development of pulmonary hypertension. For example, what causes a left to right shunt? And what is the underlying pathophysiology? Well, you typically see this with a congenital heart defect like a VSD, PDA, or ASD, you know, what we've discussed in the cardiovascular section, which causes more blood to have to flow through the pulmonary circulation to get the same amount of oxygen to the body. And it's this increased blood flow which causes endothelial injury via sheer stress, causing the vessel walls to become thicker and thereby increasing pulmonary arterial pressure. So how do you treat pulmonary hypertension? Well, first you try to take care of the underlying causes if you can identify them. Otherwise, you're going to think about things such as calcium channel blockers, prostacyclin analogs such as epoprostenol, bosantin, which is an endothelin receptor antagonist that we'll talk about in the pharmacology section, and then as well as multiple phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors like what? Well, like sildenafil, right? Better known as Viva Viagra. Sorry here, guys, I had an extra D, so please ignore the second D in sildenafil. Now, over time, you're going to get complications from pulmonary hypertension. And that includes what? Well, that's going to include things like poor pulmonale, right ventricular heart failure, and on physical exam, you're going to see things like jugular venous distension, lower extremity edema, and hepatomegaly. And so, at the end of the day, some patients may require a lung transplantation for survival. The key to understanding pulmonary vascular resistance is to understand its relationship to pressure and flow. Does this sound familiar to you? 
Well, this is pretty much the resistance pressure and flow fact that's discussed on page 282 in the cardiovascular physiology section. So you might want to go back and check it out. Again, it's not necessary to memorize the equations, but you do have to understand the relationships. Resistance equals the pressure gradient divided by flow. In this case, R is pulmonary vascular resistance. Q is cardiac output, and the pressure gradient is delta P, which is the difference in pressure between the pulmonary artery and the left atrium. Pulmonary vascular resistance is directly proportional to viscosity and inversely proportional to the radius raised to the fourth power, which indicates that the radius is the most important contributing factor to resistance. So it makes sense that the part of the vascular that has the least total cross-sectional radius contributes most to resistance, and this is generally the arterioles. So changes in the arterial radius have a much greater impact on pulmonary vascular resistance than other parts of the pulmonary circulation. Now let's talk about the oxygen content in the blood. As you know, oxygen in the blood is either bound to hemoglobin or dissolved. A couple of minutes ago, we discussed the mechanics of oxygen binding to hemoglobin and the implications of hemoglobin unloading as it pertains to oxygen delivery to the vital organs. Normally, one gram of hemoglobin can bind 1.34 milliliters of oxygen. So, assuming a normal concentration of hemoglobin of 15 grams per deciliter, how much oxygen is bound to hemoglobin? Well, the answer here would be about 20 milliliters of oxygen per deciliter. It's significant to know that the oxygen content of arterial blood decreases as hemoglobin falls. However, oxygen saturation and arterial PO2 do not. Now, chronic lung disease, like pulmonary edema, can decrease arterial PO2, and exercise can decrease venous PO2, even if you had a normal arterial PO2. Knowing the oxygen content carrying capacity of the blood is particularly important when you need to decide when to transfuse a patient. The alveolar gas equation here is used to calculate the alveolar arterial oxygen gradient, or better known as the AA gradient, which is useful when trying to figure out the cause of hypoxemia. And we'll talk about hypoxemia a little later on. Fortunately, the step one does not typically make you do these calculations. So really what I want you to take away from this is how the variables relate to one another. So what's the bottom line here? If you see an AA gradient, that's greater than 15 millimeters mercury, in the setting of hypoxemia, you should be thinking about some sort of VQ mismatch, a diffusion problem such as pulmonary fibrosis, or a right to left shunt. This is a useful framework here for understanding the various scenarios in which not enough oxygen gets to the tissue. But before we dig into this, we have to correct some errors here. Unfortunately, the manuscript got a little screwed up when it got laid out in the new color design, and I apologize for this. Basically, we have three classes of oxygen deprivation, and these are all examples within each class, which are not really related to each other. So please otherwise ignore those horizontal lines. And you can see here we actually fixed it and removed it here versus what you actually have in your book on page 565. So we have a corrected version of this at our blog at firstdteam.com under the RADA tab. And so you can get the clean version right there. Hypoxemia occurs when the partial pressure of arterial oxygen is decreased, and it can be caused by things that decrease the amount of oxygen that enters the lungs, where you would otherwise have a normal AA gradient, such as high altitude or alveolar hyperventilation, or by things that prevent the oxygen in the lungs from entering the blood, i.e. a high AA gradient, as we just discussed, such as VQ mismatch, impaired diffusion, a right-to-left shunt, which could include what? Well, it could be anatomic, like tetralogy of Fallot with a VSD, or it could be physiologic, like pulmonary edema. Hypoxia is the condition where you have decreased oxygen delivery to the tissue, and this can result from hypoxemia, as we just discussed, or from other factors such as decreased cardiac output or carbon monoxide poisoning. Cyanide poisoning is a form of what we call histotoxic hypoxia. Well, this is where oxygen gets to the tissues, but the cells cannot use the oxygen in respiration because the cyanide ion inhibits what? Right, it blocks cytochrome C oxidase. If you're drawing a blank on that, go back to the electron transport chain first date fact on page 106 and review. Finally, ischemia is a loss of blood flow to a particular tissue or organ, and thus the absence of oxygen availability.
This can be caused by something that impedes blood flow, such as embolus or clot, or by decreased venous drainage. Since if blood can't exit a capillary bed, then no blood can enter it either. You can also argue that decreased cardiac output is kind of a form of ischemia, and ischemia, like hypoxemia, is a subset of hypoxia.